you ever hear the statement, it's my body and I'll do what I want with it? Uh, that's not true. I'm going to show you from the King James Bible today. You don't own your body. Saved or lost. You say, well, this sounds very negative. Actually, it's a very positive sermon. Might sound negative. You might say, well, what are you trying to say? I'm a slave or something like this or whatever. Let me show you the truth. You see, the modern day society out there with evolution tries to get you to doubt the existence of God because God's so mean and He sends people to hell and all this other stuff. Uh, there's a different side to God that you need to understand. You need to understand why He sends people to hell. And what does God think about you? Let's look at this. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 14. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest, me, or compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and be before, and laid Thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy, are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Now obviously Dave, David was a saved man. He's writing this as a saved man. I understand that. But the whole point is, you read through the Bible, there's not anywhere where God says, hey, I couldn't do anything because it's their body and they have a right to do what they want with their body. No, the fact of the matter is, everyone, I don't care who you are, what you look like, what problems you have with your body, the Bible says here, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Did you ever think about this? I mean, evolution. We've all just come up random, you know, from random goo. Somehow life came from non-living matter. You know, inorganic material produced organic material. Figure that one out. You know, it's like saying, you know, here, I'll just, I'll take this uh, remote control here. It's eventually, just watch, it's going to grow into a tree. How long would it take for this thing to grow into a tree? So it's not going to happen. Then why would you believe that you came from a rock? You go back far enough. That life came from non-living matter. It's ridiculous. Now, the fact of the matter is you are fearfully and wonderfully made. What's the fearfully all about? Well, you look at yourself, you look at the complexity of your hands. Do you, you ever think about, could you duplicate something like that? That can move? Look at those knuckles and the skin and how the nerves are in there and you can pinch yourself here on the tip of your finger. Oh, that hurt a little bit. All that stuff. Protect you from, you know, putting your hand on something hot and burning your skin or whatever. You got all this detail just in the hand. You say, what's the fearfully about? I don't get it. If some being out there in the universe can make something so complex as just your hand, uh, you might want to fear him. And that doesn't mean running and screaming and no, 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 no. Say, wow, what an incredible, incredible designer that made me. And the fact of the matter is, He knows everything about you. The Bible says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Creator. He is God. And He knows everything about you, including your secrets. Including your deepest, most secret thoughts. He knows everything. He has seen everything. There's nothing about you that is a mystery to God. And see, two ways to look at that is, number one, you can say, well, I don't think that that's fair. That's just, that, that's an invasion of my privacy and whatever. Or you can say, he cares about me that much. 
You see, the God of the universe, he's not up there just some uncaring being that looks down at the earth and just, ah, oh, whatever, you know. He watches you. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. Do you know the president personally? How about the Queen of England? How about whatever, world famous person? Do you know him personally? No. But you can know the God of the universe personally. It's an amazing thought. Absolutely amazing thought. And you know what? The God that formed your hand, the God that made your body, He knows what's best for your body. That's why He wrote this book. That's why He warns about some things in this book. Things that He calls sin. Because those sins are bad for what He created. The body that is fearfully and wonderfully made. God says, hey, don't do that. Hey, Stop doing that. Drunkenness. Drunkenness is bad for you. Oh, but we like, just like to party, just have, like to have a good time. Um, okay. Do you ever come out of being drunk and feel good? No. You know why? Because you've been poisoned. Yeah. That's why if you continue to drink and continue to get drunk and drunk and drunk and drunk and drunk, and drunk it's going to create what's called cirrhosis of the liver. Look it up. You might know about it already, but if you don't, look it up. Little holes all through your liver. It'll kill you. That's why God's Word says, stay away from drunkenness. And many other things. Fornication. Any kind of sex outside of the, the bonds of marriage. God says, hey, stay away from that. Why? It'll kill you. You'll get some kind of sexually transmitted disease or whatever else, you're not going to be happy fornicating with multiple partners all your life. That's not happiness. The Creator has special plans for His creation. Let's continue. Psalm 24. Psalm 24, verse 1. Give you a real good strong verse here on God owning you. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God owns you. Did you know that? He has a right to do whatever He wants with you. So that's not fair. Why isn't it? Did you ever think about that? These people, oh, that's not fair. I, I, don't, I don't think it's fair that God did this and did that. Why not? I mean, you know, you go out and you build some uh, house or something like that. Let's just say that you really have a desire, a strong desire, and you go out and you build this really neat house, and you sweat and toil, and you get the whole thing done, and you go back to whatever hardware store to get some finishing touches or some things, some paint or whatever else, or, and you go back and somebody else is in your house that you just got done building, and you say, what are you doing? Well, you have no right to tell me what to do. You say, well, I'm the one that built the house. So what? It's mine now. You see? You see the issue there? God owns you. And He tells you what to do. And if you disobey what He tells you to do, He has a right to do whatever He wants with you. You belong to Him. You are His creation. You are not random goo or random whatever else that's just going to go back to the dirt again. I mean, why do you even want to believe a thing like that? It's kind of weird, you know? This life is all that there is? What a depressing thought. I mean, you can mess up your own life, I understand that, but there are things that will happen in your life that are out of your control to mess, up, to mess you up for the rest of your life. Would it be a good thing to just say, well, you know, some guy hit me in a car accident, I'm paralyzed now, I'll be this way, and I'm just going to die and just go back and rot? Just be like an animal. No, there's eternity. You are a special creation. You are above the animal kingdom. Even though evolution tries to pull you back down into it. Turn to the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26. 
We're going to see the New Testament teaches the same thing as Psalm 24, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26 says, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So you can't say, well, that was just Old Testament or the New Testament. There it is. Lines up with the Old Testament. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. It says here, Under the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Yeah. They don't, they twist the good works and things that, should be there as a as a, somebody that gets saved, but here's the whole point: unto the pure, all things are pure; but unto them, in other words, to the saved, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. I'm going to explain salvation here in just a minute, but the whole point is: the average person out there today that's unbelieving, they have no problem at all defiling their body because they think it belongs to them. Your body doesn't belong to you. God cared enough to give you life and so that you could look at your life and you could look at yourself and you can say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. If there's a God that's so powerful that he can make such a miraculous body and things and, and that works so, so amazing and, and you can look in, in your eyesight and, and everything else and breathing and, and you don't have to think about blinking your eyes. and I mean, it's just, there's so much that the body is just so amazing. And if there's a being that could make me in this amazing condition, he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy. I need to get to know him. And I can get to know him. Okay? But you see these people, I mean, all the time I see it now. It's just like years and years ago, there were very few people that even had tattoos. Now it's just so common. I mean, there's people that just, I mean, there's some woman stocking shelves at the grocery store the other day uh, when we were there, wife and my, myself, my wife and my son, and she's got, you know, tattoos all over her arms and things you know and stuff and on her fingers and, and i'm just going you know it's an attractive woman and I'm, I'm thinking don't you look at yourself in the mirror and things what's the deal she thinks her body is her own she can write on it and tattoo it and things it's pretty weird and again you say well well oh, come on you're against tattoos yes i am ink is toxic and when you're etching ink into your skin, uh, it's getting into your bloodstream. Okay, and I don't mean that all of a sudden you cut yourself and tattoo ink comes out or something. No, I'm saying small trace amounts of it get into your bloodstream. It's going to give you, you know, different types of diseases and things. I mean, it's not good to have toxic ink in your skin that's there forever. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's again, it's weird to me. I don't understand this. You know, let's look at another scripture here. Romans chapter 6. We're going to read Romans chapter 6. We're going to see the contrast here um, between saved and lost. And what this thing is about, you know, why I control my body and things. No, you don't. And especially if you're saved. Um, verse... Or, excuse me, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Okay, let me stop there because I do want to talk about salvation because I realize if there's somebody lost, you're probably going, what? Well, I don't understand what the difference is. Okay, here's the difference. All right, what is salvation? What is an understanding of salvation? I'll say it that way. How do you know I'm saved, I'm lost? Is somebody born in such and such state on such and such street and that makes them saved? No, no, no. Uh, well, if you were born in the church and baptized and stuff, does that make you saved? Definitely not. Salvation, biblical salvation, is a personal decision, decision where you say, I want to get to know my Creator. And you understand, you, you know, you hear the gospel or you read it for yourself in a Bible, a uh, gospel tract like this or, you know, or a uh, you read the Bible for yourself and you read how that Jesus Christ came to the earth. 
He was God manifest in the flesh, and he lived a sinless life. And at 33 and a half years old, he was crucified by the religious people of his day. They executed him. And why? Because he made himself to be God, and, you know, he died to pay for sins. That's the whole thing. I mean, I'm, I'm having to kind of really simplify this. I mean, if you want to watch the whole salvation message, take you through all the scriptures at our channel page. It doesn't cost you a thing but your time, and I'm never going to ask you for money or whatever else. So don't get weirded out. I'm not going to tell you to go to church either. Don't do that. All right. Personal relationship between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. But understand, your sin, when you mess up, God, your Creator, loved you enough to send His Son to die in your place, to take payment for those sins. The things that He tells you, don't do that. Please don't do that. And you did it anyhow. Jesus Christ comes along and He says, okay, I'll die in your place. Because the wages of sin is death, you see. God makes such strict rules. He says, okay, if you do those things, you're going to have to die for that. But He loved you enough to send His Son to die in your place. See? That's the beauty of salvation. When you understand what Jesus Christ did on the cross, you believe what He did. You can't see it, so it's an act of faith. Okay? Faith means that you are not seeing it. You're just saying, I believe it. I understand by faith that this thing, you know, happened. And then through that, you, you call up out to the Lord and you say, Lord, God, you know, I, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I want to get saved. Please save me. I don't want to go to hell when I die. Again, God created hell for the devil and his angels. So a whole lot of stuff here, but you know, I'm just trying to under, help you understand the basics of the gospel. But when you get saved, when he saves you, you have to, you know, now you'll finally understand, hey, wait a second here, this body that he gave me, this is his property. You know, it was his to begin with, but now he paid the purchase price for my salvation. And now he really has the right to tell me what to do because I've accepted his son as my savior. See, your life will change. That brings us to this point, Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You come to the cross as a sinner. You understand, I'm a sinner. I don't want this life anymore. So why then continue it after you get saved? You will struggle with it. We're going to see that. But you don't want to continue in it. Verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Again, remember, sin is negative. Whatever sins that you do where people come up with this thing and they say, it's my body, I'll do what I want. Again, abortion. I'll give you another good one. Well, it's my body, I can do what I want. Um, well, it's not your body that's being aborted, it's the child. It's the baby in the womb that's being aborted. And I also just need to say this. You say, well, uh, I, I can't have this baby right now, and it doesn't matter. I just, I, you know, whatever, I need to get rid of the baby. Um, abortion is extremely, extremely unhealthy for you. Very, very, very bad. A woman's body is designed to carry that child the whole way through the time of being with child there. I don't use the term pregnant because it's not a Bible word. But uh, the time of being with child at nine months your body goes through hormonal changes and through all kinds of things to get ready to deliver the baby. All right? And you go through the whole thing, the positioning of the baby and all this stuff. You want the head down, you know, and all, everything. Okay? When you abort that child, you're, it's just like you're, you're driving along and somebody just goes <clears throat> and yanks on the, you know, or this way, yanks on the emergency brake. And you just go, you know, and just, you know, or just say it this way, takes your transmission and just throws it in the park if you have automatic. Not good for the vehicle. 
You say, but I stopped. Yeah, but it's not good for the vehicle to do it that way. You can stop being with child or your pregnancy to use the modern term, but it's not good for your health. Not at all. All right. Any sin that you do, anything that you do, or the Bible condemns it, it's all negative. It's all bad. And when you get saved, the Lord's going to help you to say, okay, now I understand that relationship that I have to my creator. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Hey, tell me what to do, God, and I'll avoid those things. You're not going to want to be in control of your body. Verse 13, Neither yield to your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin, because we are under the, not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Okay. Once you get saved, genuinely saved, when God saves you, when that happens, you're not going to lose your salvation right now as a Christian in the church age that we live in. All right? The church age ends at the rapture, and it goes into the time of Jacob's trouble, and in there you can lose your salvation if you take the mark of the beast. Right now, that's not going to happen, right? And the church, you know, if you're saved, you're going up at the rapture. You don't have to worry about the time of Jacob's trouble. So just to clear that thing up. But you say, well, then I, I'm not going to lose my salvation if I sin. No, you're not. Well, then I can sin. No, because, you know, God's grace is there. He's not going to cut you off and things. But the fact is, if you sin now as a Christian, you're going to suffer for it. You know, as I've said so many times, all sin is negative. Every single bit of it. Verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield, ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Again, servants. Your body is not under your control. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now, after you get saved, yield your members, servants to righteousness, unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Can you say a big amen to that if you're saved? Yeah. It's amazing. You can look back at your life as a lost person when you get saved and you can say, I was killing myself. I didn't even realize it. I mean, I, I could understand. I, I really had no serious direction in life. I thought I did, but it was like my life kept getting worse. And you look back after you get saved and you go, I was headed for death. I was before I got saved. Things weren't getting better for me. They were getting worse. So then why would I want to go back to that? Isn't that weird? When I got my relationship with my Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, when I got that figured out, I don't want to go back to the way I used to be. See, that's the whole point of this study. Okay? Okay. Verse 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You're not just an animal. You're not just some kind of a evolved you know, creature that eventually is going to just die and go and just rot like a squirrel or a snake or an ant or whatever else. God has a plan for you. You get saved, you're going to have eternal life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please think about that. If you're out there and you've been deceived into thinking, hey, it's my body. I can do whatever I want with my body. You might want to talk to the creator of your body. Realize that he owns you. He makes all the rules and he gets to tell you, hey, that's bad for you. I mean, you go out and you buy a new vehicle. And uh, you go to the gas station and you say, well, it says put gas in. I think I'm just going to put diesel in. This here says uh, oil, cap up there on the motor. 
I think I want to put some Kool-Aid in it. All of a sudden, things start going wrong with that vehicle. What's the best thing to do? Talk to the manufacturer of the vehicle. Okay? The problem is there are a lot of people out there in this world that are putting the wrong things into the uh, vehicle. You know? They're doing the wrong things. They're abusing the uh, body that God gave them. And they don't want to go to the uh, manufacturer. They don't want to turn to God. That's a shame. You will never find happiness in this life until you know your Creator. Until you get it figured out. And you will never know true happiness until not only you get it figured out that God created you and He owns you, but that He sent His Son to die for your sins. And you get your personal relationship worked out between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. And you come to Him in faith and you say, I believe what you did on that cross for me. Call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Please do it today.